Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. I'm Heather Kiefer. I teach middle school STEM grades six, seven, and eight at Slinger in Wisconsin. And I also have Russ Herman here with me today. He teaches uh, technology and engineering up at the high school, uh, but he is also a STEM 101 director of academic programs. So he's gonna be able to answer a lot of questions and guide you in the STEM 101 curriculum. And he also led the past webinar in case any of you were in on that one as well. That was for high school level, more specifically grades eight through 10 um, beginning courses. And we're going to follow a similar format from that webinar, but bring it down and show you how the STEM 101 curriculum paired with some of the NASCO equipment can be very effective for the middle school level. We did choose to put grade five in there as well, knowing that in different parts of the country and around different areas, schools can be structured differently. So know right off the bat that what we're gonna show you today is extremely flexible for that middle level age group um, and could extend down into junior highs or upper elementary, intermediate schools, anywhere in that middle level, basically grades five through eight. So what we're going to cover today then our basic agenda is we're going to talk about what makes a STEM activity a STEM activity, what makes it different than a science activity or a math activity or a project that you've maybe done in the past. And our main goal going with our title is we want to create thinkers, doers and problem solvers in our world. Now more than ever, that's a high need. So how do we as educators do that? We're gonna specifically go through projects and activities that I use in my classroom with my students that I feel allows them to think, allows them to do, and allows them to ultimately solve problems. At the end, we'll have some time for questions. You can ask your questions throughout as well, but we'll make sure that we can connect you with Russ or with Jordan on whatever specific questions that you may have. So right now, we're going to take a poll to find out if you're already using a STEM curriculum, if you're in the market to purchase something, and just kind of see where the audience is at. And while you guys are working through those questions and letting us know a little bit about yourselves, um, I'm going to start out by letting you know a little bit about myself. I've been teaching at the middle school for five years. Uh, we began this progress process of turning a tech ed program into a STEM program. So we kind of built it from the ground up and we found that the STEM 101 curriculum was a good skeleton and a good resource for us to meet the goals of what we wanted to there. And along with that, the screen that we have up right now, what makes a STEM activity a STEM activity we wanted to make sure that we were gonna include things that really were meaningful and were going to meet the goals that we wanted to with our students. We feel that there are six characteristics that make it a STEM lesson. Um, if you look on the internet, go to the bookstore, walk down the toy aisle, you'll know that there's a lot of things being marketed as STEM and STEAM. And I feel that that elementary and middle school age group is a huge target of that. So what, what truly makes it a STEM lesson and even maybe better yet, what, what makes it a good STEM lesson or STEM activity and something that's worth taking the time to do in your classes? Um, the first thing that we feel is really important is that it needs to focus on a real world issue or a real world problem of some sort. When we talk about this in my classes with my kids, automatically the problems they think of are the big ones, the global ones, COVID-19, global warming, world hunger, things like that, which are important problems and more than now than ever need people with STEM skills to solve and find solutions for. But we also talk about that real world problems come up every day. Um, that no small, no problem is a small problem if, if it's something that a solution can help improve and can help impact the lives of others. We talk about problems being things that are just things that are already good that could maybe be improved as well. 
and that helps the kids um, get hooked in. The next characteristic of a STEM lesson, a good STEM lesson, is that it's guided by a design process. Um, I don't do anything at all in my classroom, big or small, without explicitly mapping it out with a design process. You can see on the screen here, there are many different ones. You might have one that you like to use or that you've seen that's been published. They're very similar. The one that we use is the one in the middle on the bottom with the blue background. A few years ago, we kind of just took the best of what we liked and put it together in a process for ourselves. As you look at all of them, you might see that the building or the developing, the creating part always falls somewhere in the middle. Although that is not typically where a kid or a student is gonna start, they like to just jump in on the build. And a good STEM lesson is going to guide them through the process and have them be successful in the process to show that each of those steps is going to make the outcome that much more meaningful. Another characteristic is that they immerse students in hands-on inquiry and open-ended exploration. It's very easy for us to say that students and kids today are lazy or they just don't want to get active, but they flat out just don't have the opportunities that um, we possibly had when we were growing up or they just don't know that these are things that they can do. Even kids that seem like they might not be interested most of the time are nervous or are afraid they're going to mess something up or would rather watch somebody. So we as educators need to make sure we're providing students with these types of experiences over and over so that it doesn't become a situation that causes anxiety, that they can have fun doing it, and that they can see that they can be successful. On the other hand, you have kids who love to just jump in and get involved and be hands-on. Um, we want to balance that out with the students in our classroom of both types. The next important characteristic of STEM lessons is that they need to provide students with the opportunity to involve in productive teamwork. Um, we want to teach them to seek collaborators, collabor collaborators even during times when they're doing things individually on their own so that they realize networking to bounce off ideas one on one another. Um, when they're working in a team situation that they see different ideas as being a benefit rather than that being something that's a hindrance to them. So many of these activities that we're going to highlight today, um, you'll see will actually give the kids that chance to practice that teamwork. The next characteristic is that STEM lessons apply rigorous math and science content that your students are learning. Hopefully it's content that they already have learned or that you're going to be learning and you're kind of coming in at it from a different angle. I love, the best thing I love about my job in teaching STEM is that I get to be that person that gives the kids sometimes that aha moment. I get to answer the questions of when in life are we gonna actually use this? I get to catch them scribbling out math on the back of their packet because they're trying to find a solution without handing them a worksheet of seven math problems of a certain type. So these, you're gonna find that STEM lessons, depending on what you're looking for, if you're looking for something to start a STEM course that's dedicated totally just to STEM, or maybe you're looking to infuse more STEM into your existing curriculum, you want some STEM units in your science class, you want some STEM units in your math class, or something in another part of your day, um, that these are the ways that you can see that they're going to use that we talk about our brains kind of being like a toolbox that we're filling up with different skills and different knowledge. And it's STEM that then allows us to pick and choose and put those pieces together whenever a problem may arise. STEM lessons also allow for a multiple of right answers 
and that failure is a necessary part of learning and that it's okay. This is a really tough thing for kids to handle unless they have the time to fail and try it again and be more successful and give it another attempt. Most of our everyday structure of traditional education learning is not that way. Um, I've taught all grade levels from grade one to eight, with the exception of second grade. And I know that each curriculum has a scope and sequence. There's a lesson that needs to be done on day one so that you can move on to the next lesson for day two to assess on that unit and move on again. We don't often have the luxury of that time to allow kids to give it another shot. But in STEM, that's part of that process. That's part of the design process that if in the end your result is not what you anticipated or what the end goal is, try something else and keep on doing that as much time as time allows. So we want to make sure that kids understand that and that there might might be multiple correct answers that are all okay. Some sometimes might be better and we wanna keep improving. An example I often share with the kids is the TV. When the TV was first invented, it was one of the most amazing things ever. People wouldn't have thought about changing it. And each year, each decade, things keep happening to make the TV even better than it was before. It was the TV's not a problem, but they're finding ways to continue to fix it. So if we want to create thinkers, doers, and problem solvers, how exactly are we going to do that? You know, it all sounds good. We understand what the end goal is, but it can be a big task, especially if you're someone that's jumping into this for the first time, or you're trying to develop a program within your school, even if you're just trying to develop a unit. So we want to make sure that in whatever we do, that we can go beyond the project. Innovative teachers today need to move beyond every student doing the same step at the same time and taking home the same project to mom and dad that looks the same as everyone else in the class. Um, we're not going to promote projects in a bag that um, don't have that process behind it. And that's what leads us into the next point of following the design process. If we follow that design process, the kids are gonna get more out of the experience than what that final end product or thing is. We want to make sure if they're gonna be thinkers, doers, and problem solvers that we're teaching them skills. Each of these activities that we show today have specific objectives and specific, specific skills that are taught. And then they get the opportunity to practice those and develop those. And then hopefully that's something that goes into their toolbox. They can say, oh, last year I learned how to use a protractor. So now I know that I could grab that out of the drawer and use that for whatever next problem I need to solve or whatever next project I need to do. This is by doing these things, we're going to empower students to hopefully step up and try new things and persevere through if things aren't going as hoped. So as we dive into this, I want you guys to think about anytime I'm sharing an activity, what part of it do you like? Are there things that stand out to you that you would change? Do you know that you've got some ideas of things that it would be great if you would add in? Are there things that you know you could do better? Because what will make your students better thinkers, doers, and problem solving and problem solvers? What I absolutely love best about STEM 101 and what led us to ultimately choose this as the backbone of our curriculum is its adaptability. I teach grades six, seven, and eight. In our district, we service the elementary school children and they feed into the high school. So we've got students that come from all different experience levels, all different background levels, all different levels of comfortability and what they wanna get involved in. And um, the best part of this, if you decide to use any of these activities, is you can change them in any direction that you need to. If you need to simplify it, if you need to add more enrichment or rigor to it, they're very, very adaptable that way. Mm -hmm. 
So when we began, we decided that we would purchase the three middle school STEM 101 courses. And right now, the way that they're set up is kind of by theme, discovering STEM, designing with STEM, and investigating STEM skills, each level getting a little bit more in depth. The grade levels that are assigned to them are very loose and very flexible. So as you're looking through this, please do not be turned off by the number that is designated with it, thinking, oh, I don't teach eighth graders or I don't teach sixth graders. Um, I continually swap out activities from these different courses. By purchasing all three, we felt that we had the full spectrum of everything available. And then what was also very convenient for us NASCO puts together kits for each of the specific units within those courses that have absolutely everything that you would need to run that activity as it's listed in the lesson plan. And that covers um, complex equipment and things that you wouldn't find anywhere else. And it also covers the basic things, scissors, paper, anything at all that's on that list that you need is included. So it doesn't cause you to go rifling through the back supply room or your own garage at home or basement trying to find just a couple more of something to make it work. So when I got started, the things that popped out to me first, it was like anything when you're starting a new course, a little bit overwhelming especially when you have the comprehensive amount of courses available. I'm actually just going to pop back to that slide real quick to link and show you the platform. So when I say we bought the three courses, this is what I'm talking about, the three that are listed along the bottom here. And as I click on any one of these, it will list each of the specific units. And then if I click on one of these, which I'll do later on when I'm showing you specific activities, um, it'll show you all the activities and all the components and the resources and the teaching that's in there. So when I speak to it being a little bit overwhelming, um, it can because you have a lot available to you. So the first thing, I'm sorry, I keep going backwards. The first thing that popped up to me was that there were some really cool units that were focused around flight and knowing that flight can be a very high interest area to kids. And that's that's important. There's a lot of things out there in the world of science and math that we could be teaching kids about, but we want it to be something that's gonna hook them in and something that they're, wanting, they're going to wanna do and maybe learn more about. So we noticed that there were three distinct activities that focused around flight. And I decided to use that as a scaffolding to spiral some of the same content, but getting higher levels of rigor each year. So I picked three of them, one to use in sixth grade, one to use in seventh grade, and one to use in eighth grade so that we always can continue to build. We're gonna highlight each of these. Um, as you can see, I've got some, some pictures of projects from things that my students did. And again, know that it's adaptable. Things don't have to look this way. You don't need to have an open stairwell for this hot air balloon activity. Um, these are just the ways that we made it adapt to what worked best in our situation and for our kids. So at this point, I'm going to begin to go through specific, specific units that are in specific courses. And I'm gonna take you back to the platform each time to show you how those things are laid out. The first one is a unit called Properties of Flight. It's part of the sixth grade Discovering STEM course. And as you look here, it might seem kind of simple. And that's exactly why I chose it for my very first sixth grade introduction course to my STEM kids. Um, there are pictures of the planes that they built this year and you can see there's many different ones and there's pros and cons and interesting parts of all four of them. Um, but what was great is throughout this process, I learned that this was the first time many of my kids folded a paper airplane. That, that seems something that we take for granted, but many of them had never done it. They didn't know how to do it. Maybe they'd had someone do, do it for them. So 
what I want to remind you is that sometimes our activities that are most meaningful have to get stripped down to something a little bit more simple. Um, it doesn't always have to be the most incredible project in the end or the most expensive high-tech equipment that they're going to get the most learning out of and the most hands-on experiences from. So this particular unit focuses on these different bullet point objectives. I'm not always going to read each of them to you, but for this first one, I'm going to kind of lay out each of the parts. So it covers the four forces of flight. You're going to see soon that STEM 101 does an amazing job of providing background knowledge. Um, as we go, I'm going to highlight a lot of things that I never knew until I was a STEM teacher that these kids are learning in sixth grade. The math part of it, you can integrate mass and surface area into this lesson. The design process is key, and this is in my courses, their first experience to walking themselves through the design process. You can learn about material conservation. And then something that I add on is um, using a spreadsheet to collect data. So I'm going to take you out to the course. So I just linked in um, to that sixth grade course to the properties of flight. And any of the units are organized in a very similar way. There's a lot of pieces that are available to you. Um, you're gonna find as I keep presenting to you that I use them all in different ways. There are some that I use as is exactly as printed in their entirety from start to finish. There's some that I use just components from, and there's some that I extend and I've added things to. Whatever fits into your time frame or how often you're seeing your kids, um, I think there's enough materials there, but don't feel that you need to do every piece of it. I usually don't use the pretests in my courses just because I only get to meet with my kids every other day for one semester, but it's nice to know that those things are there. Um, so that's the first link. Um, what I found most beneficial, especially when I first started, was this area of teacher resources. These are things that are there for you. Um, they might be things that you end up um, sharing with the students, but mostly it's to make sure that you have the background knowledge that you need. There's, and I'll just show you here, a basic lesson plan overview. Um, so this is kind of the teacher version of it, like what would be the teacher pages in the book. And it goes through a uh, pretty standard lesson planning format, including your materials and time frame, shows you how you can pace things out in lessons and break things up, and gives you some areas for differentiation and adaptability. So it's already designed to be adjusted, so you don't have to feel that you're locked into anything the way you may see it specifically. What I've also found extremely helpful then is the content knowledge. They, Seminole One has prepared different resources. Many times they are a PowerPoint presentation or a video. Um, one of my favorite ones here is this. I'm not gonna play the whole video for you, but it's um, a reference to them on airplane failures. So I'm just gonna see if I can skip ahead a little bit. Making and, a successful flying machine requires and its pilot at the intended flying speed. So you can kind of get the idea, but what's nice as a teacher is this video is linked right here. I don't have to see if I lost it in my bookmarks, but there's often something like that that can kind of be a kickstart. So when my kids come in, I don't say, hey, we're going to learn about planes today. I just play this video and I say, what do you think of this? And what do you think this has to do with STEM? And that's a great tie-in and a kickoff. Um, and one thing I really like in particular about this Properties of Flight unit is it's a great way to start that design process. If you look at the history of flight, it shows in history the failures that everybody had to go through until the Wright brothers had that success of being the first flight. Along with the content knowledge, then, there are these presentations. So, for example, dynamics of flight. So they watch that video and see all of those people looking pretty silly, dressing up like birds to try and fly. What, what didn't they know? What did the Wright brothers know or discover that they didn't know? And what do we know now? 
and what can they learn as sixth graders? So flipping through Air here. Is Airplane Turn wings are curved down. on the top, which makes air move faster over the top of the wing. It... Sorry about that, but it does have those options because you can share these directly with your students. Um, if you've got students that are learning from home, they can you can share this information so they can use it as well. But what I like about it is it breaks it down. Um, basically, how do how do the wings lift a plane? That's the concept that the kids need to know. What are the forces of flight? This is the basic background of it. So no, we're not just gonna fold paper airplanes and throw them as hard as we can and, and hope something good comes out of it. We're gonna try to build on the knowledge and engineer something based on that information. So it's great that all of that is linked right in there under the content knowledge section. The student activity then is their design brief or we like to call it our engineering notebook in Slinger. So you can use this as is, you can pick and choose pieces from it, copy and add in your own parts, but it breaks it down in kids language. And you're gonna find that each of these are set up following a design process. So they usually have to do some kind of predicting or some type of brainstorming and planning. STEM 101 is excellent about having areas here, they're defining their criteria, so they're figuring out what the problem is they need to solve. And then here are some ideas. There's four boxes for a reason because your first one favorite idea might not always be the best idea. So they're already encouraging multiple ideas before you even begin to build, before you even try to fold. And they provide that room for that. In these areas are also the places where I like to sometimes either simplify or extend. If I ask my kids to come up with four different designs here, their final solution, maybe that one needs to include measurements. Maybe I want them to calculate the surface area of the wings of their plane. All of these are very flexible in allowing you to do that. They move into their testing stage and there's always room for that data. What happened when you flew? What was the distance flown? What were the recommended improvements? So always we're having our kids ask us the, their own question of what worked well with this first plane design? What didn't go so well with this plane design? And most importantly, what else can I try to get different results? The reflection questions at the end honestly have very much guided me in who I am as a STEM teacher and really showed me the importance of what they're doing in the process and reflecting on their learning rather than having a test at the end where they need to get 80% of the questions correct. If you look at some of these questions, you can see what was the main problem you found during this project? What are some improvements you would make if you had to do this again? So even if they revised it three times, what would you do if you had a fourth time? What would you do if you had a fifth time? Explain the impacts of consumables and the responsibility of product design. So these questions are wonderful at connecting what they did in their classroom to what's really going on in the real world and what they may sometime in the future as a career or just as an adult have to work through in real situations. So it's not isolated just to a, a pair, paper airplane made out of paper. They also provide some great rubrics um, that have some very consistent key points that they're looking at. Um, it's not how pretty the plane is in the end, but what was your effort? Um, what was the creativity? How is your time management? Did you carry out your plan? So um, life skills are really what's being assessed often in those rubrics. And then there's also opportunity for the post-test, very similar to the pre-test, and supplemental resources that go above and beyond the things that were in the content and also um, ELL Spanish documents so that we can provide these materials, videos, things um, in whatever way needed to meet all of our students. So that's kind of an overview of what you get in the package of one unit. I'm not gonna go through all the components here on out. Um, if you have any questions at this point specifically about the platform or those pieces, you, you can ask now. You can also ask questions at the end as they come up, we'll address those. But moving forward then, I'm gonna kind of just take you on a field trip through kind of what I feel are my favorite 
and which are the ones that I choose to do over and over. I tell my kids all the time, I wish I could keep them all day because there's so many more cool things we could do. So it's it's kind of like going to the buffet and filling up your plate and there's always gonna be something good left that you didn't get to use this time, but maybe you'll be able to work it in the next time you visit. So I'm going to go on to the next one. I did wanna just quick add, I just see that I have this linked here. So there wasn't anything in that lesson about a spreadsheet, but that was something that I felt was important to do with my kids. So I just set up a simple Google spreadsheet um, where they are keeping track of their distances. And as you can see on the bottom, this is all my sixth graders so far this year. And each tab is a different class. And then they're able to um, look back and see how theirs compared. We use this to do some simple data sorting. We sorted by mass, we sorted by distance, and then I posed the questions. Is the mass of the plane going to affect the distance? And they were starting to look at, as, look at that as a data an analyst. They found, and maybe not particularly in this class, but they, when they look back at all the other data, that some of the heavier planes fly further, some of the lighter planes fly further. And what's great is it always comes back to those four forces of flight. There's always a kid who raises his hand and says, I think that you have to have the right combination of the forces. It can't just be one of those variables that's gonna decide if you win or not, but certain designs can enhance the lift or can make the thrust carry all the way through. So those are the great moments as a teacher when you see those connections happening. So then the next, course. So like I said, I did a sixth grade, a seventh grade, and eighth grade all kind of wrapped around flight. That's their first unit of the year each time. So for seventh grade, I am using the seventh grade designing with STEM course, and I'm using just one activity from the defining the problem unit. So STEM sets it up in the ways of kind of the outcomes and the goals, not necessarily a project-based unit. So sometimes you have to kind of look and see what's all available in there. And I'll show you for that one. Um, this picture is of my students. And um, at the time when we ordered our kits, I'm kind of jealous now because they have a new and improved rocket launcher. Uh, but this was the one that came with our kit. And I do want to speak to NASCO uh, on NASCO's behalf on that because it came with all of the pieces. It came with the copper piping, it came with the electrical tape, it came with all these fittings and um, the part that you can't see is some tubing and a bike pump and a video of how to, video of how to put it together. So um, even that, like I said, it has the most simple things. It had a package of note cards, it had the package of straws, it had the clay but it has everything that you need from start to finish so that you can do the whole activity. Speaking of that, I do see that there's a question that came up, how, does one, how long does one activity take to do? And that's a really great question and something that's very important when you're planning. Um, I'll show you in the next one that I go into how it shows some of the time frame, time framing. Um, my units, I tend to make be very long just because I want to go through the whole process and I want to spend time on each step um, that's highlighted there. However, when I show you in the platform, you'll see that there are some that you can get in and out of in a couple of class periods. There are some that could be three weeks. So when you break it down, you can pick and choose that way. My class periods are 40 minutes, which I know is maybe kind of on the smaller side. Some elementary schools might have three third, or a 30 minute period. Um, so we do um, chunk it that way. And then a lot of times the main activities we're doing over a course of a variety of days, but it is very dependent on the unit and the activity that you're choosing. This one in particular, the straw rockets, um, also really highlights the idea of independent and dependent variables. Just to kind of break down for you what the concept of this one is, is they um, build this very simple rocket, straw, note cards, tape, clay, and they're going to look at the different components. What happens if there is a longer or shorter body? 
What if it has more fins? What if it has a different shape of fin? What if it has a different size of fin? Does it make a difference what shape and size the nose cone is? If you look really close, you can see the one on the right has a long nose cone and the other one has a short little tiny nose cone. And I think these were actually the two, um, they were going for the face off. Those are the two that were flying the furthest and they wanted to battle each other. Um, this, what I absolutely love about these straw rockets, if you're asking how long an activity takes to do, a kid can plan out and build one of these straw rockets in a 40 minute class period. Um, they're not having to work with igniters and um, adhesive and paint a rocket, which is all a cool project to do for another time, but that's not, not the purpose of this one. This is the learning the process to get them building the rocket, make a change, launch it, make a change, launch it, and to keep doing that. If I go ahead and connect to this one for you then, you can see we're in the seventh grade course. And let's see if I go into the teacher resource and try and find um, a pacing kind of for you. And if you look, here it is at the top. It kind of gives the overview. So eight to 10 hours is what they're saying. This specific activity would take from start to finish. And then you could break it down what fits into your class period times. But they're all very different. You'll find that some are short and some are longer. The next one then that I um, like to do is that progress of flight is the lighter than air vehicles. What's interesting is this one actually comes from the sixth grade course, but I use it with my eighth graders. Um, it covers the ideas of buoyancy in flight, so it's taking things a little bit further. Um, I focus on accuracy and precision with my kids because how this one is laid out, and this is one that always <clears throat> seems to be a student favorite. I'm going to skip right to the student activity. So they, they're they given a plan. They're given a design plan, a template, coordinates. Basically, that's what this is showing you of how to make a specific hot air balloon. So in this case, if everybody does it the same, it will turn out the same. And then they can study the effects of buoyancy. It actually uses a hot air popcorn popper that's got the top pulled off of it, which again, comes in the kit. Um, to launch, so it's safe. There's no open flames, um, nothing like that to worry about. And that's why I feel like all these activities are very, very user friendly. If you're doing this in a fifth grade classroom, you don't have a lab. Um, these are things that you can do. You don't have to worry about having a dedicated, safe science grade lab space to complete these things. And you can have the kids be safe. What makes this an eighth grade unit for me though, is I tell my kids they have to change something about that plan. So that then just brings up the level of rigor. It now became an eighth grade course where they're trying to uh, deal with different things as far as adjusting the size without getting too much weight. And it adds a whole different level to it. So that is just a very easy change that I was able to make that way. I'm gonna keep going so I can highlight um, each of these others in the time that we have left. Our next one is um, out of the flight sequence then. So I do one flight for each grade level, but another one that I really love and I feel is extremely versatile is design and modeling. It's a perishable fruit container. And this one I actually have gone opposite with. So it's an eighth grade activity. There's a lot of rigor involved, which I'll talk about in a moment, but I've simplified it down. And um, this one I don't do particularly in my curriculum as a course, but I've offered this to my fellow, fellow teachers We've had a time in our schedule called team time where kids need to be involved in different enrichment activities that are supposed to be science or math related. Um, so I've offered this one um, and has been used by my colleagues to design a container that will safely transport fruit. The design brief as written asks for you to design it for 25 pieces of fruit. 
but we've done it with a couple. We've done it for one piece of fruit. Um, the original one for the eighth grade level is asking them to monitor temperatures and different environmental conditions. They are limited with a certain surface area of material and what they can use. They have to put together a proposal for the cost, which brings in all kinds of wonderful, wonderful skills, which makes it more rigorous. For sixth grade, maybe it's just designing. This is also one that I've offered up for some of our virtual students that are homebound during this time. These are things that they could do at home with household materials that they have, maybe in their recycling bin. So there's just so many different ways that different activities like this can go. If I connect out to that one real quick, I'm just gonna show you the final rubric on that to see that it has that rigor. If I zoom in on that a little bit. You can see there's temperature specifications, surface area, completion. They had to do some CAD drawings, pictograms. Is the food contained properly? So that's the way that these are highly, highly, highly adaptable. I also use the discovering and sketching, draft, sketching and drafting unit, um, which basically covers orthographic drawing. This is part of the sixth grade course, but I use it in my seventh grade and eighth grade class. Um, I use it as a way for them to learn effective measurement and then teach them the four views, uh, or sorry, the three views, back on forces of flight, that was four. The three views of an object, the front view, the right side view, and the top view, and how that's used in the industry, how that's used in creating things. And we actually lead this one in seventh grade into our next unit, which is probably my all-time favorite, presenting the solution electric guitar. There's a group um, called STEMI Stuff that puts together these kits that NASCO supplements and works through for building an electric guitar. And yes, it's an electric guitar. It plugs into an amp. The amp comes along in the kit. Um, there's an actual guitar string on it. There is a magnet. When you plug it into the amp, the electricity is flowing through, creating electromagnetism. And I, as an adult, never knew that there were magnets in electric guitars until I taught this. Um, our students use that sketching and drafting unit to actually create the base of the guitar. So if you see the shark up here that this girl took to um, her 4-H competition in summer and went to the state fair with, or the one down here of this kid rocking out on his red guitar, we we're fortunate enough to have access to a CNC router. So my students sketch out on graph paper using their sketching skills and then um, work with the computer programs and AutoCAD to cut out their bases and paint them if they wish. Obviously, you don't need to go that route. The guitar plays without anything. Um, you could use cardboard. There's many things that you could do to add or simplify this project. I think this unit is one of the best units at giving background information. I just want to quickly show you the PowerPoint they have presented for this, just putting up this flaming electric guitar gets kids excited. I don't even have to say anything if that's my starting screen. But what's the best about it as you move through these great examples is there's actually an animation of how an electromagnet works um, bit by bit, showing the different components, the magnet, the wire wrapped around it, the magnetic field, in comes the guitar string on the top, shows you that it plucks that and it sends those sound vibrations into the magnetic field, into the electricity where it's changed into electrical waves that go through to the amplifier and shows them how that electric guitar is working opposed to the acoustic guitar that they saw earlier on in the pictures. So there's a whole lot of learning that happens in such an amazing hands-on way when they're able to hold that in their hands, hook it up to the amp and try it stripping it back to the design process. They hook it up to the amp and no sound comes out. Then they know that they did something wrong with the wiring and that circuit isn't complete. So it's natural consequences, natural testing of those concepts that they're learning. 
The last one that I wanted to highlight for you guys then today is manufacturing a product. This one we use with our sixth graders. And the STEM 101 lesson on this is very comprehensive. They have great outlines and presentations on what the manufacturing process is. So it may look simply as kids doing crafts, but we break it down to they have to design their design on paper. Then as a team, they have to decide what design they're going to make. And then they have to figure out how are they going to use supplies to make that come to life and mass produce their prototype to make them all be the same. Um, kids have to do a pitch to their team. There's so much that can be learned through this unit. It's a great hands-on one that you can tie in with maybe some things going on in your school. We do a laser engraved ornament sale that we try to tie into this unit as well. So speaking of that, that's one way that we also extend to equipment that we have. We, again, um, have some great equipment. I mentioned our CNC router. We have a laser engraver. We also have 3D printers. So the end of this unit, my extension is whatever the team that wins or that they vote on is the best design, I will make a similar one either out of wood or 3D printed out of plastic for them to compare and contrast. What are the pros and cons of making something handmade? like that you maybe find on Etsy or something that's mass produced in a factory. And we learn about the limitations of both systems and the processes and the pros of both systems. So it makes them look at the products in their world in a different way that these things just didn't magically end up on their table at home or end up in the store or just fly in from Amazon. So we are getting to be at about um, 10 minutes left in our hour of presentation time. So I wanted to open it up if you guys have any questions for me specifically on any of these activities or units that I showed you. Know that of the three courses, I believe there's 12 or so activities in each way, eight to 12 in each of those. I'm only showing you a spattering of them. So we're probably looking at less than a third or a fourth of all the activities that are available. Um, I'm seeing a question that says, when you order the kits, when did I order the kits to start teaching my different units? I was lucky enough to um, come into the district when Russ Herman was already using STEM 101 at the high school. So he kind of showed me what it was about. I liked what I saw and we we ordered the kits and the curriculum all together. It was like Christmas, I showed up in my room and we just opened and unpacked boxes. Um, so I had that wonderful luxury of just picking and choosing which of those that I wanted to use. Um, but NASCO is great about working with that and providing the materials that go along with it. It was very much a seamless process. And for a new teacher, um, I couldn't have asked for a better experience with it that way. Do I have a starting point for fifth grade? That's a good question. Um, I would probably look at that sixth grade unit course first, but not limit yourself um, to excluding things that are in the seventh and the eighth grade courses. To me, it's about low of the content rather than what the projects actually are. So personally, I would say the starting point for fifth grade is the design process. What is an activity that you feel you could comfortably work with them? What appeals to you? What's going to get them excited to get their hands dirty and work through that process and then build that way? And I can't stress more that as a teacher, you know your kids, you know your population, you hopefully know a little bit about what they maybe did before coming to you and hopefully what they're gonna do after they leave you as their teacher. And if you can just find that bridge in between there, um, it's all about the process of it and whatever topic is gonna make it most exciting for your kids is the one that's gonna be most meaningful and something that they're going to remember. Another good question, are the kits for a classroom or do you have kits for individual students who are learning virtually from home? I'm gonna ask Russ to maybe answer this one. I can touch on it a little bit. So typically uh, the kits are coming in 
for a classroom setting only. Um, it depends on how at home would be or virtually. A lot of these units, I think you can do some things without some of the, the resources that NASCA would supply in, in purchasing the, the supply, the kits uh, that they offer. There is potential ways to get that the supplies to individuals. It would probably be more on a per school, per class, per district basis. Um, I know Jordan, who's uh, mediating this session from NASCO, he and I have talked about what that could look like for at home or virtual. So we're in that discussion right now. And again, I think that would be probably a more per district or per, per teacher basis. Definitely doable, yes. Um, it would just take some creativity and planning and mapping to make that happen, but definitely doable. And from personal experience, I can speak to kind of two ends of that. Last spring, when we were completely on quarantine, we were in the middle of some things. Um, we actually had just started that paper airplane planning unit. Um, and I found it was, I don't want to say easy, because nothing about that time was easy. But I was able to take my presentations, take those STEM 101 slideshows and content and push that out through whatever platform, Google Classroom or whatever, um, and, and kind of make things digital with them knowing that process and telling them to grab things from home, do parts from home so that it wasn't just abandoned and I didn't just turn them over to some, some type of fill out a worksheet or fill out something online. And I was able to get my kids off of screen time when they were during that time at home last spring. Um, for my kids this year that have been exposed or quarantined or having to be out for an extended amount of time, I've been able to do some of the things as well. Um, so that's what I like about many of their units that, that it, isn't necessarily tied to a specific computer software or program, that there are things that you can be flexible in, in times of change. Are the kits designed for one kit per student? Nope, they're more designed for a classroom set and there are many of the materials um, that will never need replenishing. For example, in the sketching and drafting unit, you get the classroom sets of drafting triangles, those you're gonna use year after year after year. Certain things like um, paper or maybe the straws and the clay um, for the rockets perhaps would be things that you would want to replenish in NASCO. I believe maybe Jordan or Russ can speak to this. You wouldn't see yourself buying a whole nother kit. You could purchase certain components and pieces from NASCO as needed to replenish, I believe. Sure, I'll touch on that for a second. Um... So the kits are designed for a typical classroom of 24. And because a lot of these projects are team-based projects, you'll get enough for enough supplies for 24 students to work on uh, any one of these projects. There are consumable kits and supplies that you can purchase, which is not going to send you more hot glue guns or scissors or straw rocket launcher, but yet, the straws and the clay and, and those consumables that uh, are needed for the for the activities. So there's two different ways to purchase. One is the whole supplies for classroom set of 24 and then the consumable uh, supplies as well. Those are great questions. Anything else you're wondering or would like to see again? Is at-home learning available for individual in distance learning? Um, that's kind of a hard thing to answer just because I know I think every district is handling things in a little bit different way. At least they are in our area. Um, I, I guess I'm wondering, maybe for clarification on that question, if, if I don't know that STEM 101 has a platform that would go directly to a student bypassing the teacher. I think a school district would consider purchasing the content, the curriculum, uh, the LMS, the learning management system that Heather was going through. 
There are some at-home kits that can be purchased for individual use or um, distance learning or virtual, however your district would operate. Uh, there are some that are specific to particular units. Again, I think that would be some planning, some mapping things out and making some connections and correlations with some of the at-home kits and, and the content. So STEM 101 does that. Uh, I know NASCO has other individual kits as well that could potentially complement the curriculum. So again, that would take Jordan from NASCO, myself from STEM 101 to, to sit down with someone and, and try to, to lay down a foundation and, and a good plan to make that happen. But having looked at all the different things in those middle school courses, I definitely think there's good potential to pick and choose things out of there that would be conducive to kids working at home. Any other questions? Hey, Heather and Russ, uh, this is Jordan again. Um, I did have a question come up on the cost. So I, I can speak a little bit to that. Um, so if, if you're looking at a cost for the middle school curriculum, um, the sixth, seventh, and eighth grades are all separate. Uh, per cost is $550 for the curriculum. And then depending on the materials of the kits, uh, that will differ per grade level. So just kind of depending on what you're looking for, um, I can send out a link to a landing page actually too to give people a little bit more information about uh, STEM Academy. And let me grab that really quickly here. And that will also give you a little bit more input to um, also the materials for each of the different grade levels. So if you're in middle school or if you're at the high school, um, depending on what you're looking for, and let me get that. So I just, you know, I got to present to everybody. Sorry, I apologize. Jordan, you want me to stop sharing our screen? Uh, no, you can keep the screen up. That's fine. Um, and I just wanted to kind of thank everybody for coming today. Um, and thank you, Heather, for presenting. Um, my name is Jordan Nelson. I'm one of the customer engagement managers with NASCO, and I was the host for today's webinar, focusing on the STEM and engineering activities within the STEM 101 curriculum. Um, but if you do have any more questions, you can ask them at this time. And as you're maybe writing those down, I did want to make a quick note that there will be a recording of this webinar and you'll also be receiving that in a follow-up email. You'll also be receiving a survey right after the webinar as well. So please take the time to fill that out. We appreciate your feedback. And then lastly too, if you would like to connect somebody with NASCO outside of this webinar, um, you can certainly do that as well um through the survey and or feel free to reach out to us at engage at nascoeducation.com which you see up on your screen as well if there's any other questions that anybody has about the content or the use uh, for the grades the middle grades or upper elementary uh, you can feel free to write them at this time um, we'll wait on here maybe another minute or so to see if there's any other questions I'm not seeing any other questions. Is there any last little uh, tidbits that you want to say, Heather, about the program, uh, about the use of this year? Um, yeah, anything I'm, there? And just once again, I said it once, but it's worth saying again, is it is highly adaptable. So if any of you are feeling lost or that you just need a resource to start pulling things from, because it can be overwhelming and sometimes you feel like there's you don't know where to turn um so i i've found it to fit very well in with what we need to do and i keep making changes each year and it keeps on getting better so i think adaptability is the key for this program especially in a middle school level grades k4 um I'm going to let Russ speak to that in a minute, but but one thing I am seeing in it is that kids, the things that kids are able to do keeps moving down. Like we, we keep saying there are things that we originally started doing with high schoolers like, hey, maybe the middle schoolers can do this. And then as we're leveling up to what we want my middle schoolers to do, we're talking to our elementary students saying, hey, do you think the fifth grade students could do this? What about working this in the third grade? 
So I'm going to let Russ speak to that. I don't think they're specifically designed K4, but again, I wouldn't completely rule out anything that you see in there as things that you could adapt for elementary age students. We have uh, dormant elementary content and curriculum that um, the reality of STEM curriculum is the amount of time that elementary teachers can use and, and uh, go through a STEM activity. And typically that becomes in a special time and there's not a lot of time for that. So there is some content there. It is dormant. I'm making a note of looking at that again to possibly reintroduce that. Um, whoever asked that question on our screen, you could contact me, Russ Herman at stem101.org, um, and we can continue that conversation. When I taught elementary school, that's actually when I first started working with Russ as our district STEM person. And we worked really hard to work with our other elementary teachers to see how they could connect their math or their science or even their social studies or English and language arts standards and units that they had to be following in a STEM way. So if you're trying to do that in your district, that might be a way to find time or steal time is to make it cross-curricular because STEM always is cross-curricular. And thank you everybody for being with us. Thank you again, Heather and Russ for joining us and presenting. Um, and if anybody has any other questions, feel free to reach out to us via email um, and we'll be more than willing to follow up with you. Thanks everybody and enjoy the rest of your day.